I want you to know what a blessing you have in our praise bands. I was back at uh, Cedar Hill, my small church that I was at for the last six years before being here. And they have the most wonderful pianist. And she does such a marvelous job. And I'm always so grateful to listen to her. But I'll tell you what, there is something exciting that our praise band brings to worship that stimulates the heart, draws us closer to the spirit, and just allows worship to take place. And I'm grateful for that. This is safety month. And I learned something this morning that I've never known, and that's that this church actually has a button that you push if there's a tornado. In 45 years, I have never been in a church that had a tornado button, but this one does. Now, if we receive word that there is a tornado approaching while we're worshiping, you will hear the following. It's, it's coming. Now, in case of a real tornado, we'll keep that running all the time. <laughs> I want to thank Ron Feather is at the back pushing that button at both services, and we appreciate that. If that happens, that means that there is a tornado close enough to be a concern. And what we ask is that you stay right here. I think we all know the drill. If you're near the windows, you probably want to move to a vacant seat inward. What you need to know, and they're practicing it this morning, is your children and youth are safe. The immediate moment that alarm goes off, their teachers and the staff will begin moving the children and youth to rooms that are internal to the building without windows they will actually be safer than you are. And you don't need to worry about them. I know those people, and they would lay down their lives for your children and your youth. So you can trust them with them. If, however, you are told that there is a tornado coming and you want to go get your child and leave, First of all, see Jason or I, we'd love to talk to you. But secondly, they will release your child or youth to you. So if that's what you want to do, you can do that. Including if you just feel you'd like them with you at that moment and want to bring them back into the sanctuary. But they will be safe, okay? It is my enduring hope that that's the last time we'll ever hear that sound until next May. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus. We'll be sharing from the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 10. By the way, this afternoon, I'd like you to read further the rest of birth, the fourth chapter. We're going to talk about it a little day, but it wasn't included in the scripture that Jason uh, set forth. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to me, your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave people their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight 
or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else and let them do it. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. Okay, I never have people in the front row at a Methodist church. So if I start to wander down the aisle, tell me, and I'll try to get back where you can see me if you want to. <laughs> this is the last Sunday in the sermon series that Jason started. I'm not even going to tell you what the title is because I'm really afraid I'll mess it up. Amazingly, that has to do with what we're talking about today, and that's the fear of failure. Have you ever been afraid? In particular, have you ever been afraid to try something, to do something? Afraid that you wouldn't have what it takes, that you'd fail, that you'd fall short. It can happen anywhere. It can happen in school. We can be afraid we're going to fail a subject. We can be afraid we're not going to make the friendships. We can be afraid we're going to fail in a lot of ways. I remember I grew up in the Chicago area, and I heard that the basketball tryouts were coming up. So I said, hey, that sounds like fun. I'll go try out for basketball. I don't think I had ever held a basketball in my hand. And understand that in the small schools in Nebraska I've taught at, if you can't hold a basketball, they'll say, great, you're a starter. And they'll teach you. In Chicago, they say, get lost. We don't have time for you. There's 100 good people. I sat there waiting for my turn and watching everybody before me. Basket, 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 dribbled. I'm sitting there saying, Lord, you have to dribble? And I'm saying, what am I doing here? You ever been there? Just afraid? Afraid you're going to fail? Afraid you're going to fall short? That's where Moses was that day. And I think I understand where Moses is coming from. For 45 years, I've either led Bible schools, been a part of Bible schools, taught in Bible schools. So when I came here and saw the Bible school was coming up, the first thing that was very natural for me to do was sign up to be a part of the Bible school. They wanted to know if I had taken the courses I told them no, but I happened to know the pastor if that would help. I got here the first day. Have any of you ever participated in PBS here? The rest of you don't know what you're missing. I was a crew leader and the PBS started and everybody is bouncing. Now if you want to see something strange, it's this old body bouncing. But I begin to bounce, and my knee is saying, why are you doing this? And I'm saying, Lord, what did I get myself into? 
And I was really afraid I was going to fail that week. But I ended up having a lot of fun. Two years ago, I came to a crisis point in my life. Understand, I'm not a great pastor. I've never started a church. I've never built a mega church. But I've never left a church worse than I started. If they weren't paying apportionments, they were when I left. Their attendance always was up. At least one, two, three, every year, we always went up. And I was excited by that. I thought I was a good preacher, a good pastor, and I enjoyed that ministry. And then I got sent to Ashland. Uh, don't get me wrong, the Ashland Church is a wonderful church, and the people are wonderful. But I, for the first time, found myself struggling and afraid. Every time I brought a young family into my church, spent time with them, got them situated and going and feeling like they were a part of us, the new church down the street, the next thing I knew, had them in one of their small groups. And within six months, they were in that church. For the first time in my life, attendance wasn't going up each week. For the first time in my life, we weren't growing as a church. And I was struggling. And then a former bishop told us that the value and success of a pastor is measured by the growth of the church. So at a time when I was feeling like I was failing anyway, my bishop was telling me, yeah, you are a failure. And I was afraid. And in the midst of that fear, I felt like I couldn't succeed. And I wanted out. Now, fortunately, God agreed, and he said, John, it's time for you to retire. I have other things in mind for you, and we did. But that's why I think I understand where Moses is coming from. You would have thought that what Moses had seen, that he would be ready to say, wow, Lord, let's get going. I mean, this man saw a burning bush that wasn't burning. I have never in my life seen a bush that wasn't burning that was burning. Read Exodus 2 if you need more. He was looking at God. And God is saying, I've called you, Moses. And Moses says, uh, Lord, I think you've made a mistake. <laughs> you must have meant some other shepherd that was wandering out there, and I saw this by accident. He says, what if, I, what if I go to them and they say, who sent you? And then God gave us what we call today the tetragram. That's a big word that means simply this. He told Moses what his name was. The Hebrew people became so afraid of saying the name of God if their heart wasn't in the right place that they removed the vowels and some of the accent marks from the name of God so that they never could speak it or read it. That's the tetragram. An earlier time in the 1600s, they decided that the tetragram was, was for Jehovah. But modern scholarship has found some more ancient manuscripts that lead us to believe that the name that God gave Moses that day was Yahweh. God told Moses who he was. And he showed Moses the power he had. He said, Moses, stick your hand inside your cloak. I know Moses did not have buttons. He got his hand inside his cloak. 
And God said, pull it out. And Moses pulled it out, and his hand was rotting and decaying. The skin was falling off the bones. And God said, put it back now. He said, now pull it back out. And his bone, his hand was perfect. Moses saw that. He saw other things God was going to do. You would have thought he would have said, wow, this God is pretty awesome. Let's get going. But instead, he began to do what all of us do when we're afraid to fail. He started making excuses. Today we read, but God, I, I'm really not that good a talker. And God says, who cares? And then Moses gets down to the heart of the issue. He says, okay, God, I don't think you're getting the point. I've tried to give you some outs here and you're not taking them. You've made a mistake, so let me just say it frankly. Find someone else. I don't want to do this. By the way, have any of you ever been there? And the Bible tells us that God began to get angry at Moses. But in doing so, he made concessions that show us how God works within our life. Next slide. I want to begin today by talking about the fear of failure. In everything I've experienced in life, in everything I've read, the fear of failure begins with shame or embarrassment. Nobody is afraid to try something they do well. Agreed? If you're an expert machinist like my dad was, you don't go to work every morning saying, I think I'll fear it being a machinist. We fear you're failing at something we don't know. And we fear when we fail that we'll fall flat on our faces. And that's scary. I don't want to go out on a limb, fall flat on my face, and have you all laugh at me. I don't know many people that do. Now, next slide. I'm trying to hurry because I really went too long at the early service. If you want to hear the long version, get the tape when we're done. You're getting the shorter version. I hope. Some of the things that fuel the fear of being afraid to fail, the shame that comes from that are feeling inadequate. In fact, I personally think that's one of the most important. In the previous slide, you saw a young boy with words pointing at him on the blackboard. Some of you are very blessed, and I hope you understand how blessed you are. You grew up in families that were affirming and supporting. They loved you and they made that plain. They allowed you to fail and they were there to help. They were good people. Not everybody grows up under those circumstances. I will never forget the day my mother looked at me and angrily said, I wish you had never been born. That hurts. There are people that live with that. Our daughter was doing pretty good until she got to school. That's where the bullying can start and a lot of kids get hurt. Be aware of that, parents. They won't come home necessarily and say to you, somebody bullied me today, but it eats at how they feel about themselves. And when we feel like we're not that good, then we begin to feel very inadequate and afraid we're always going to fail. And it pervades every area of our life. I know some of you have been there. 
because I've heard it. You know, you're just like all the people I've had the privilege from God to serve over the last 45 years. You're good people who love the Lord and are sometimes afraid to share that. I know because I'll say, you know, God's putting on my heart that you'd be a good Sunday school teacher. And what I hear back is, me? I don't know the Bible that well. Any of you ever heard that? Any of you ever said it? I've been a pastor 45 years, and I don't know the Bible that well. I don't have all the answers. My daughter says that she thinks I have all the answers because she says I'll say something no matter what. But I really don't have all the answers. It's easy to feel inadequate. How many of you have known a friend or a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus? And God has put it on your heart to talk to them. And you sit there and you say, I don't want to risk that friendship. I don't want to look foolish. I don't want them to laugh at me when I'm sharing my heart. And so we never do it. The fear of feeling inadequate is crippling, and it keeps us from serving God in the way that we need to. I think the second thing is concern about exposing our sin. The reason I ask you to read the rest of the chapter is that after the passage we read this morning, there's a very, very strange passage that follows. You would think if God has spent all that time arguing with Moses and finally convincing him to go, that God would send him with his blessings, right? But instead we have this strange passage where Moses is on his way and God shows up and starts trying to kill Moses. Huh? Well, we learn something in that passage because Moses' wife grabs her son and circumcises him and takes the foreskin and throws it on Moses' feet. Wives, I really don't recommend that as a normal everyday practice. You see, Moses was a Hebrew and he knew it. And from the time of Abraham to be a Hebrew, you were to circumcise your son. I believe it was on the seventh day. Moses had an uncircumcised son. He was living in sin. And that sin was hindering him from doing his work. All of us understand that because how many of you are afraid that if you get close to somebody that they might discover who you really are? Or they might see that sin that you don't want to share with other people? How many of you just are paralyzed by sin. It strikes me as a problem that time and again there are things in my life that I know God has power over. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know God can change it. But I'm coming to the reality that I don't want to. Have you ever been there? And it's kind of like God is saying, this will make you better. And you're saying, but I like what I'm at, God. Sin can hinder our working for God. But I think the most important thing is that we lose sight of God. The deeper I got into the distress in my last church, the further away I got from God. It shouldn't have happened because God had shown me things that were overwhelming just as he did Moses. I had stood in the presence of God and felt his holiness. I had seen my life change because of God's presence. How many of you realize that you're not the same people today that you were 10 years ago? Because of God working 
in your life? I should have known better. My dad was an alcoholic, and the alcoholism killed him. I had sworn I was never going to do what he did. And then one day in college, I found myself trying to get into my room, and I couldn't move. The room was spinning so fast. I hope none of you have ever been there. I think I got physically sick, but I don't really remember much. And I remember that the bed stopped moving long enough that I collapsed on it. And the next day, I said, God, what happened? How did I get here? And he said, John, you have to know something. You're an alcoholic. You can never, ever drink. That was 42 or 3 years ago. And I haven't touched a drink since then. You have those stories too. How many of you guys used to swear a pretty good game, but you're more uncomfortable with it or don't do it anymore, right? Because God's working in your heart. And you begin to see that that's not the sort of language he wants me to use. That's not the way he wants me to talk. When we lose sight of God, we lose sight of the life changing power that makes our life real. Next slide. I believe that we learn from Moses and his encounter with God how to handle that fear of failure. I think the first thing we learn is that to overcome the fear of failure we begin by facing our sin. You and I know and understand that sin is not helpful in our life and ignoring it is the worst thing we can do. We understand that it keeps us from growing closer to God. And there comes a time when we have to acknowledge it. The acknowledgement may be as simple as, Lord, I know I'm sinning and I don't want to change. Can you help me? It may be, Lord, I'm ready to surrender and lay this at your feet. But wherever we're at, the starting point is recognizing that we're sinners and giving that sin to God so that we become stronger people. Next slide. The next thing we need to remember is that God loves you. That your lives matter to God. He knows you intimately. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he loves you. How do I know that? Because when I was a person that I didn't like very much, God gave his son's life to save me. Because he loved me. That's how much he loves each and every one of you. You matter to him. And if God asks you to do something, if God sends you on the work of the church, you can trust that God wants you to succeed and that God will help you succeed. He told Moses some things. Next slide. To help us succeed, God, number one, promises to help us. He told Moses that. He said, I'll help you. He said, I'll teach you. Now, brothers and sisters, I think we need to understand that. Like I said earlier, 45 years a minister, and I still don't know everything in the Bible. There are still passages that puzzle me. Brothers and sisters, we can't wait until we know it all to do God's work. We can't wait until some magic point that we hit. We have to trust that the one who loves us, the one who wants us to succeed, will teach us what we need to know. 
we need to understand that God himself, he promised. Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to what? Why did he send the Holy Spirit? What was the Holy Spirit going to do for us? Hmm? Comfort and guide us? Absolutely. But well, there's one more thing. What was it? He will teach you the meaning of everything I have said. Right? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And when God sends us on a mission, we may not know all we need to know, but the Spirit will explain it to us. Understand this. God never will tell you and give you everything you need to know. God sends us out in faith. A number of years ago, I was dreading a pastoral call I had to make. I was, in fact, sitting in the car in front of a house where the 18-year-old son had been killed in Iraq. And I was sitting there arguing with God. I was saying, Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't have any words to comfort, any words to help them. And he said, go. And I said, Lord, but tell me what I'm going to say. And he said, no. And I said, Lord, I need to know. And he said, no, you don't. You need to go in there. And you need to trust in faith that when the moment comes, I will put in your mouth what you need to know and say. That's how God works with us. He doesn't say, let me tell you the outcome. Let me tell you what you need to know. Let me give you a script. He says, walk with me in faith. Trust me. And I will be there. And I will teach you. And I will put the words in your mouth. And I will help you. Because I love you and I want you to succeed. Lastly, we learn that when God began to get fed up with Moses, he said, okay, you don't have to do this alone. One of the hardest things I ever learned in the church was that I didn't have to do it alone. And I spent too long in the ministry doing it alone. Now every Wednesday I'm in a covenant group with some of my fellow pastors, and we encourage and support each other. And everywhere I've gone, I've found that God is more than willing to provide lay people who will encourage me and help me and make the ministry theirs, and we carry it out in wonderful ways. God wants us to succeed. God wants you to be successful. He will help you. He will bless you. He will teach you. And he will provide the people you need to work with you. Amen.